Hey folks, Ray from BCBrainRecord.com here. Thank you for joining the live stream. Uh, hopefully you're, you're seeing this and hopefully it's working out just fine. Uh, let us know in the comments about the audio. It's definitely gonna be a little bit echoey, um, but let us know if it's a little bit too loud uh, or a little bit too soft and we can probably change that. But uh, as we noted in the kind of open house videos in the last few days here, Echo isn't something we're going to easily fix in this place. Uh, it is all concrete all the time. Uh, this is the only thing that's not con concrete. It's a composite board, so sorry about that. Um, but I've got with me Mr. GP Llama over here uh, on this side there. Of course, you know him as uh, Shane Little GP Llama. And on this side, we have Mr. Desfit. Thank you guys for joining me. No worries. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about all sorts of sports tech goodness today. Uh, just take whatever questions you've got. So if you've got stuff uh, for Des on the wearable side, or uh, Shane on the cycling side, or you can mix and match, or you can ask about Australia, America, and Amsterdam, all. all the A's, um, <laughs> it's all there. So we've got, we've got quite a few there, got quite a few folks in here so far. Uh, so this is also the first time we've ever done a group live stream, haven't we? Ah, uh, it is, indeed. And this is also your first live stream. Uh, well, it's actually, no, it's not necessarily my first, but um, uh, I've done some group live streams before, um, but uh, remote, but this is by far the first one uh, in the yeah. same room. We've pre-recorded our uh, roundtables this week, so one, two, and three we recorded today, yep. which is probably the most casual one of them all, but I think this just tops it for more casualness. Yeah. So. Though it was not casual leading up to this. We were, oh, we were down for <laughs> the last couple seconds. Like literally, um, it was a little close. Uh, we laughed because this morning we filmed the round table, third round table, uh, about like the, just our content creation process. And as part of that, uh, we made the joke that getting to the first 60 seconds of a live stream um, is the toughest part. And we totally changed the entire setup for today. We went totally new software, totally new, everything has changed in hopes it would be slightly higher quality, but also work for three people. <laughs> and then we had audio issues from up until about 20 seconds ago. Yeah. So it's not all fun and games, but actually it is quite fun, getting it all up and running. And it's from the sound of it, the sound looks okay, or the sound sounds okay. And uh, it's, okay. it's kind of been the theme this entire week, though. The uh, open house, uh, we basically <laughs> went right until uh, people started walking in. Um, I think today we had a lunch uh, appointment, and that uh, we uh, were recording the stream right until then. And then now, oh, boy, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Surgical precision. Sliding in at home there. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. so let's just maybe spend a couple minutes before we dive into all the questions on kind of recapping the week and maybe under like three minutes um, in terms of sports tech news. How's that? Uh, so, I will work backwards, right? Okay. Um, so, this morning, uh, I guess this morning the first one was Zwift. So, can we talk about what Zwift did this morning? And do you actually have a video on this? Sure. My phone is over there, so I can't pull it up in front of me, but I have a video links somewhere on that one. Um, about the Zwift Companion app. So you can now create, and the biggest uh, update to the Zwift Companion app today is you can create your own events. Everyone's been asking for uh, events to be organized by themselves or by their club. Zwift were controlling their events. Um, you had to email Zwift and get them to put in the calendar and choose everything. Now you can actually load it up. It's only the first step and I think what's coming. But I can say, hey Ray, I'm gonna start a llama ride. I, I can invite you, I can invite Des, I can invite a few other people myself. I still have to grab the people and invite them. And you have to uh, accept that and come into the ride. Um, but yeah, pretty cool stuff. And I, I always already see some uh, spin studios saying we're going to use this straight away. So we're going to have their own organized rides because the spin studios don't start on Zwift's schedule, they start on their own schedule. So pretty cool stuff. Cool. And then on your side, uh, Des, there was the Apple Watch announcement with uh, ECG that just started off or just was finally enabled. Yep, absolutely. So that's going to be great for me because I'm basically going to be flying back home uh, and I'll be wrapping up my Apple Watch Series 4 review. and. It's, thank goodness, so I can actually wrap that into the, the review. So, yeah, I did test it out a little bit already. Um, looks like I'm pretty healthy, I think, for the most part. So that's yep. good to hear. <laughs> cool. And then uh, on my side, so I hope you're noticing or saying to um, a couple things. One, to stop banging on the table, Shane. But uh, two, that I'm part of here. So we're going to move me a little bit closer again. again. Uh, a few of you mentioned going to Omni on the mic, and we're hesitant to do that because when I talk this way, it reflects off of that. So uh, it's a really tough, tough thing. So we'll see if that fixes it. Um, if not, we will go and try it on me, and then we'll see how bad that ends up being. But uh, we'll we'll start there for the moment. Uh, let us know. Um, it does say that we need to stop putting things on the table, so we won't we won't do it too much. Um, we don't know what else to put, to be honest. Uh, but the last thing I want to talk about that I kind of kind of explore second news on the selecting side is the canning of the interbike show. Mm, um, so canceling that is definitely a bummer. Um, so interbike, of course, the biggest cycling event in the U.S. I would say um, for like cycling industry, anyways. There's you know certainly big like uh, Fondos and stuff like that. And I think some of like the, the smaller homemade shows are um, that they're popping up, but for like the main industry stuff, mm -hmm. you have like you have Interbike, Interbike is in September, Eurobike is usually late August, and they moved this year to Reno, and I thought the event was actually a great event compared to years past. 
Um, they've been asked for since 19, they're going to cancel it. And then in hmm. 2020, they're going to reevaluate it, maybe go to something a little bit smaller. Uh, well, smaller again than Reno? Reno was pretty small. I think smaller is more, sorry, I'd say less expensive. Um, uh. which I, I would have thought Reno as a city was actually relatively inexpensive to get to yep. um, or to, uh, to stay in, but I think actually the getting to park is where Reno tends to be more expensive, at least especially for me internationally and you as well. Yep. Um, Reno is not a cheap place to fly to. No. Um, it's definitely a bit trickier. Uh, so, anyways, with that, we're going to dive into some questions. Uh, let's see what we've got here. We're going to scroll. Uh, we have switched over to Omni yet, so hopefully this is a little bit better than, than before there. Um, scroll up here, we're going to see what we missed. Uh, go back to the top. Let's see, what do you think is the future of entry level training plans? Uh, from uh, Jules, uh, training peaks in today's plan are focusing on the high level segment and do not offer great UI. Entry level training plans. I think just riding your bike. I like sim mode. That's what got me riding my bike. I haven't actually used, to be honest, uh, the, the Zwift training plans. I think probably they're more entry level than anything. Um, the ones that will just tell you to ride this today, this tomorrow, have a rest day and away you go. Really, it's not really about the, you know, the exact wattage itself. It's just about consistency. So entry level for me has always been about consistency until you start hitting those higher end zones. So for me, if you're just new to cycling, just ride your bike and ride your bike a lot. Um, the Zwift ones are probably the way to start. Um, but again, you can't fail with those. Any session is a good session, even if you fail. So yeah. I'd say just choose one and go with it. No, I, I think I agree. I'm going to switch over to Omni now. We'll see how that works. Um, let us know in the comments if that does. Not my voice in particular, or if it makes it a lot worse. Um, if, if not, we'll do something different. But uh, uh, yeah, I think for... For me, I totally agree with you that it's just about consistency. It's about doing this consistent things and adding uh, volume effectively each week um, mm -hmm. on a very consistent basis over a long period of time. There is no like secret sauce to that in a lot of ways. Um, it's one of those things where you just got to do the work. It's, it's the Eddie Merckx, isn't it? Just ride your bike, ride your bike <laughs> lots. Yep. Yep. Cool. Uh, so scrolling back up again past all the audio type comments that we'll uh, eventually figure out. Um, so, Des, what do you think is the best fitness tracker from uh, Laurent? What is the best fitness tracker with GPS integrated? Uh, gosh, I would probably lean towards the Vivo Active 3. Um, I know that's a little bit get, getting into more smartwatch, sportwatch territory. Um, I do wish the Charge 3 would have come with GPS. That was, um, especially with the price, you know, increasing just a little bit uh, this year. I, I, I do wish that it had it. You know, maybe next year they'll they'll maybe integrate it and uh, have a little bit, just a little bit higher price point. But... Um, I think the Vivo Actor 3 is a pretty darn good device uh, overall, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think the key there in that one is the best fitness tracker as opposed to the best overall GPS watch. What do you, what do you give the best GPS watch? Uh, the best GPS watch? Yeah. Uh, gosh, you know, that's, uh, I think that's a really gonna be a hard question. Again, I think it really comes down to what you want to do with it. Um, at best GPS watch, I think for the money, oh gosh. <clears throat> <laughs> is he, yeah, I, I like the 935. It's a pretty it darn works. good watch. Yeah, I mean, the 935, it's pretty amazing, just especially in terms of battery life. It's yes. pretty darn phenomenal. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think um, I would say the 645, but the only issue with that one is that the price may be just a little bit steep for what it does, especially compared to the 935. Okay. Point. Yeah. Um, let's see. Ali asks, is it worth investing in a Polar Vantage V yet, or be better off waiting? I currently use a uh, V800. Uh, so I've got the, so in case you'll just do a quick watch check. We'll go around the room and do a watch check. So starting off, Mr. Shane Miller has? 935. It's my travel watch because of the battery life. Yeah. I use it as a smart watch. It's also a backup if I don't have a head unit on the bike that I've loaned or borrowed. So it's my everything. But my daily go-to is the Apple Watch Series 3 okay. at home when I'm near my charger every single day. So big issues with that. But 935, let's okay. go with that. And then next, going on the circle of the wrist, on my right wrist, I have the Polar Vantage V, the one you're asking about. And then on this wrist, I'll have the Apple Watch Series 4. Off to Des. Uh, Apple Watch Series 4 on this side, and then a Gal, no. I'll double a, up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a Phoenix That's, 5. Uh, I feel do you need to go? Need well, to go to the room? I, should, I should go get yeah. another That's actually what you said the other day. You're like, oh, I'm only brought two watches. Two watches? That's <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, on my left wrist uh, is uh, the Phoenix 5 Plus titanium non DLC um, 5 Plus. Yeah, so it's a great watch. Okay. Um, I did bring a few others with me to test. I did bring the Polar Advantage Wii, B, the Suunto 9, as well as the Garmin Instinct to do a little bit of additional testing as well. So. Cool. Uh, sounds good. Someone's asking, uh, Gareth is asking, where is Vaughn? Um, so. Vaughn and the girl are 
back there somewhere. Um, they helped us lay a bunch of like pillows and blankets down, and then they they ran as far away as they could. But maybe they'll swing and they'll just they'll wave their hand or, or something. Maybe later. Uh, maybe later on. So. Uh, Question comes through here from Andy J. I've been banging on about coaching and AI and big data, and uh, with all the data that we've been uploading to Strava, Training Peaks, all of these platforms have our personal data, years and years of that, and they know how we respond to training. They know our personal peaks based on that training. You know, my my theory is one day a company will come along and use that to give us personalized training plans that will be absolutely spot on what we need and how we respond as individuals to training. The question is, who who do I think will implement this first? Who will, or will it be a new disruptor? I haven't got my head around Exert just yet, and people are telling me Exert are doing things like this, but uh, I think Training Peaks. So, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, Tra Trainer Road. Trainer Road, I think, because they said they've got their first pillar, their second pillar, and their third pillar, and they haven't mentioned what, the first was their, obviously their ERG mode, their program as we know it. The second was the data analytics and the calendaring and scheduling. The third, we don't quite know yet. And they've just come yeah. out with something recently with a effort match, or a, somebody in the comments may know exactly what they're talking about, exactly the comment um, that was put in the Trainer Road podcast that I was listening to the other day on the bike. But if you did an effort in a race, Let's just say it's a repetitive crit and you were doing over 600 watts for over five seconds every time out of the corner for 30 times or 40 times. They can grab that effort and see what training plan that matches or what, what um, specific workout that closely matches. Hmm. I think that's what I heard in there. And I'm like, oh, hang on. Mental note to go back. And I haven't gone back to that just yet. So I think Trainer Road might be on the case there. But you never know. Anyone can come out of the blue. Yeah, I think there's, it's definitely super interesting to see what they're doing. Like they've got, they've got those grand, grand vision of sorts and... Uh, um, you know, they even talked about a little bit there. They have this massive like project plan of all these features Ooh. they want to release and schedule, and they've clearly got a vision. And it's interesting to kind of compare and contrast that versus other players in the industry. And um, but we're seeing a little bit of convergence. I mean, even what we saw today with, um, or yeah, today with uh, Zwift and adding in the social features, kind of Ooh. converging in on on Strava's That's one territory. One thing I didn't mention about the yeah, the update to the day, today yep. to Zwift's um, feed function, the mobile app. You can then comment on other people's rides. You can give them thumbs up. You can also do some data analytics of that specific effort. So yeah, we're seeing a lot of things cross over, just as we saw Trainer Road cross over into what Training Peaks are doing with their analytics and their calendaring. Yep. Um, but it's about, I guess, offering one solution, one stop shop. Yeah. Because we don't want to keep plugging extra things in. We don't want to buy a new device and have to upload to another service and another service. Ray, you're totally across this, I'm sure. Yeah. So the unification of services. So hmm, we shall see who does that. Okay. So uh, Chris Kennedy asks, 820 or 520 plus, or wait for something new in, for Garmin in 2019. And Funny enough, uh, in the first uh, roundtable, uh, that was actually a question that came up in the comments section. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so um, that's a tough one. The 820, it's, um, it's going to be interesting in terms of the usability on the touchscreen uh, versus the 520 plus. Um, kind of depends on whether you prefer a touchscreen or physical buttons. Um, I'm kind of a more physical button type of person. So it kind of, yeah, just depends on your preference there. Yeah, I agree. I think that they... I, I can deal with the A20 touchscreen. Like it's one of those things like when you get air, bad airplane food um, that you're like, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'm hungry, I'll eat it, I'll use it. Um, it doesn't really bother me, but I just like the buttons on the 520 plus. I find the 1030 touchscreen is perfectly fine for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got two open water swim questions back to back here. Uh, Rod McBain asks, Marlin uh, Potasense, uh, that's basically the, it's like a, I'm trying, I'm trying to explain this thing. It's like heads-up goggles that have a little connector thing on the top so when you open water swing, it tells you where to go. Um, it works pretty well. Uh, but he asked, um, within that, any thoughts on whether anything similar on the horizon or uh, worth getting it now? I don't see anything similar on the horizon. I think part of the challenge with open water swim stuff, and kind of talk about this a little bit in generally in swim stuff, is that it's a really, really small market. Uh, generally speaking, competitive swimmers don't like to wear sports technology. That's just kind of a historical thing. It's been that way forever. So it's really tough to get um, companies to invest in that space. And you tend to see startups do it, and that's really where it, it is. But to get those startups to last a long time takes volume, and volume just isn't there. Um, so you really need like a Garmin or a Timex or a Sunto to invest in that space. But they look at it from the opposite problem, and simply there is no volume to make their, their time worthwhile. Uh, so I don't really see a lot of players on there, just probably what we've seen today Lots of startups, and those startups eventually flop, which is somewhat unfortunate. Uh, right back to back with that is uh, Yelmer, Jelmer, I'm sorry. Um, after your initial assessment of the Sunto and Garmin <coughs> and Polar open water premises, did they recover well? Nope. Nope. Next question. Um, <laughs> let's see. How many fitness legends, legends, Chris asked, how many fitness <laughs> legends does it take to change a light bulb? 
Uh, <laughs> did we get them sorted? Actually, no. no. We, we have no answer. Uh, well, Apparently more than three. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is interesting, though, because uh, Ray does have this hooked up to Google. And um, apparently it doesn't listen to Ray, but it listens yeah. to me. And me. It oh, likes the Australian okay, so accent as well. Just yeah. to prove this real quick. Oh, jeez. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's going to go Here dark. we go. Here we go. This is live. This is live. Oh, it's just fun, right? It's fun. We're having a Friday night. It was fun. Okay, was Google. <laughs> you didn't hear me. Okay, Google. Turn off all studio. <gasps> Holy crap, it actually worked for once. Oh, look at that. That is the first time it has ever worked. Now Woo! it got a little more chill in here. It did get a little more chill. Now everyone's yeah. complaining about the visuals, but you yeah. turn off the camera. Oh. The camera actually covered it. It's all on. good. No, no it's no. actually good to go. Okay. Okay, Google, turn on all studio. Sure. Whoa. Five Whoa. That you is, just have to be live. Like, that right. has never, you have to understand, I've never gotten the first time for turning it on, let alone doing both things. We'd like to thank Vaughn for sp clicking the switch. <laughs> <Yeah. over. laughs> that was all real. That was, that was, and live. That's scary stuff. I'm right? always pushing You're stressing us out, giving us some how, how close we were getting this working together. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> uh, good question coming through here from Jason about what do, I, what do we, us guys think of British Cycling announcing the partnership with Zwift? Um, and their launch of British Cycling E-Racing Championships. Ah, interesting one. It's purely marketing, the way I see it, to be brutally honest. There's nothing that relates to, and, and what I would hope to see is for this marketing campaign, if they could geofence that marketing, that would be great. As an Aussie, it has absolutely nothing to do with me. I get no benefits from that whatsoever. As a European, nothing. As an American, we get nothing. from the, If you're in part of the British Cycling um, group, sure, that's all great, but you need to keep the marketing within Britain because it's nothing new here. They say there is some uh, training plans developed specifically for British cyclists. I think on Zwift that means it's going to rain all the time and you're limited to riding London only. I hope not though, I'm only joking. Um, no, I don't know. I don't yeah. know. There's nothing, and esports and e-racing and awarding a national jersey isn't the first time Zwift have done this. Although it's probably the first time they've got a national body to um, validate it, to vet it. Um, and there has been some talk about that on Twitter. Um, I saw one of the British ex-British champions who actually earned their stripes out in the real world, not too happy with things. Yeah, I guess to me, I don't understand. Like, I think there's, don't get me wrong, I think there's lots of future in esports and lots of cool things that esports can do and blah, 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 blah. But I'm hesitant to say that esports should belong to a brand, mm. whether it be at Zwift or train mode if you want to do an esport erg thing or or at ruby or anything like to me esports needs to be one layer above a brand it needs to be a concept whether that's cycling indoors for a set time period distance whatever that is mm -hmm. and then there needs to be a way to to do that activity it's just like if you went to the track you wouldn't have like this track that only works in a certain app like just it's so On look track bikes what i'd like right. to see is sort of the concept i think you're um, talking about there or what i'm interpreting is almost an api level that if you want yeah. to come in and ride ruby as your bike in those championships. You can, if you want to ride your Sufferfest bike, let's just like, spitball here, yeah. or your Virtual Go bike, or your Road Grand Tours bike, or your Zwift bike, where is this layer on top there, where it's extremely difficult to do all this. But it would be nice to see that, because if one company, a commercial or a private commercial company goes under, it doesn't exist anymore. Nope, totally so, agree. Whereas cycling itself will always exist. Right. So that's a tough one for that. Look, at the end of the day, more people on bikes, <laughs> more people buying tech, really helps us out. People watching our content, we can help out more people. Um, and again, everyone's getting fitter. But yeah, I just like to see that marketing campaign maybe go global. So Cycling Australia, uh, maybe the European Cycling Unions get behind that as well. The UCI have been mentioned a few times in making an eSports World Championships, but that's all you'll ever see. I challenge anyone to find me an article where the UCI said they're actually going to do anything. It's in the headline. There's no details. No, it's a, it's a grabber. Totally agree. Hmm. Interesting times though, if they're even <coughs> discussing it. So um, that that's just, so just shows us how far indoor cycling has come though. Yep. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to JMV. I know you're watching. I'm <laughs> <But>, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <Hi, Mom>, not. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but uh, Gerno, uh, Gerno, uh, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but uh, for monitoring resting heart rate, are optical heart rate sensors now accurate enough, e.g. on the Phoenix 5 Plus? Um, I found that the resting heart rate to be a little bit high on Garmin devices, um, uh, but um, if you are an iPhone user, uh, the Apple Watch. It's yeah. That's yeah. that's again. Yeah. And it's probably worthwhile dividing that up into two categories. Technically, uh, sure. resting heart rate, mm -hmm. and then that's the number that the company says that you have your resting heart rate for mm -hmm. the day. Um, usually, it's like a summary number somewhere. 
and continuous heart rate, right? Oh. So in other words, um, like in the case of Garmin and Fitbit and others, they may be monitoring their continuous heart rate all day long, showing values at like 42 or whatever the heck it is, um, but the value they give you for the resting heart rate is based on some random algorithm um, that usually takes like a time slice and whether you're sleeping or not sleeping, each company differs quite a bit on that. And there's even like, there is the problem is there's no true standard for what resting, what defines resting heart rate. Um, if you look at like the American uh, Health Whatever Association, they, um, they've got this like very nebulous thing of the, the lowest heart rate during a period of time. Well, then you ask different companies and some say it should include sleep and some say mm -hmm. it shouldn't include sleep. And so that's where you get different differences. Like you know, for me, I can get my resting heart rate down below 40 while I'm sleeping. Uh, where I'm not sleeping, it's in the low 40s typically. Those are two different things. And then other companies will say, well, you got to be you know, still for a period of time after awake. It's just, mm -hmm. it's messy. Um, a question for all three of us are coming in. Uh, Gail asks, are any of you going to be at Sea Otter Classic, Classic next year? Well, given there's no interbike, we can... Uh redirect our tickets elsewhere yeah that's yeah. kind of where that's actually where we all well you guys have met before but um, that's where we all actually met for the first time all three yeah, of us yeah that's a good point funny yeah. enough but yeah yeah, yeah so I'll, I'll definitely be there I'm going to go there and do kind of a couple of things at the same time I'm going to round them all up it's in April uh, so I'll definitely be there for that it's on the cards for me no sure absolutely cool uh, let's see, let's scroll down. We, uh, we missed a whole ton of questions. Questions about Vector 3s, I'll jump on that one. Vector 3s now or still wait? And it was an interesting conversation we've had uh, around the dinner table today. Um, when a product first comes out, it really depends on how good it is when it hits the shelves first time because the product can be really tainted or uh, get a bad reputation early on. My experience with the Vector 3s was the same as a lot of others as well. And there's a lot of forum posts and a lot of my posts about it being not quite right and uh, not uh, up to scratch for what I needed, but... Yeah. The replacement pair were fine, right? Yours were fine. Mine were fine um, all along. I've been lucky. Yeah, so so not, not ones that like Garmin sent me either, like retail, standard yeah. issue ones. I'm still running the old crappy caps that you're not supposed to be still running. So I was going to say, with the new caps, um, yep. that solves that problem. And the left-right problem that I had was solved with the new set that Garmin took back. So Vector 3s for mine, I was using them for a test against the, oh, I can't remember. It might have even been the Neo 2 recently. And I was happy with the numbers. So Vector 3s, I still think they're the best looking power meter pedal out there. Yep. The Ferrero SEM has come very close. SRAM's pretty close as well. Oh, you think? I don't mind them. I think I don't. I don't like the blue on it though, to be honest. But I think the pedal itself is nice and thin, so I'm happy there. I'm simple. Mm. You got you got higher pedal taste than I do. I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. We got here. I just I saw what I wanted to answer. Where to go to? Oh man, I lost. Oh, there's somebody asked about Apple Watch. Here we go. Uh, Brian asked, uh, does the Apple Watch Series Four allow for Strava uploads? Not natively, but all three of us use the same app. Um, to go native Apple Watch workouts up to Strava, which is HealthFit Plus. Mm -hmm. um, awesome little app. It costs like, what, a dollar or two or something? Yeah. But it syncs to Strava, it syncs to Training Peaks, it mm -hmm. syncs to Fit Files, it syncs to Dropbox. Fit File Export, yeah. Yeah. Awesome little app. Uh, the dude here in, in actually, well, not here in France anymore. He was in France, but uh, he even came to the DCR Open House last year. Right. Um, so I met him there. But uh, just it's cool to like support like single developers. That's mm -hmm. just a, a single guy that want to make an app to fit a purpose and mm -hmm. that's his business that's great yeah i was using run gap actually oh um, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. before before i heard about okay, yeah. health kit and uh, yeah health kit uh, does seem to be quite a bit better it's yeah. just super clean it's it just is. like Absolutely. run gap has a lot of cool features that do other things mm -hmm. but like this is just like it's got one thing in life <laughs> it's really good at it <laughs> one Keeps thing to do simple. question coming through about the asioma pedals are they getting cycling dynamics update before the end of the year um we hope so that's that's the hope we hope so given they've just dropped their price a lot I'll cut them a bit of slack because that was a damn good price drop. Yeah. 105 euro, I think. Yep. Um, US pricing was a bit kind of weird, but they did come down quite a lot. So look, uh, as soon as that's out, you'll know on any of our channels as well, we'll either have it, install it, playing around with it. Yep. And I wouldn't necessarily that. blame uh, Fibero if they were slightly behind on that either. Like that's something where that's a lot of moving parts from a lot of companies, uh, mm -hmm. apart from Garmin, apart from uh, Dynastream App Plus, um, and apart from Fibero, all kind of like trying to get the standard. And of course, it's more than just those three companies because the standard has to be certified by the entire Power Meter Technical Working Group. So it's a lot of moving pieces there. But we saw actually Garmin release the firmware update from all their top end head units um, in beta a week ago. Good. That's absolutely beta, yeah. Yep. Yep. To support that. So you, you see those pieces are now popping out in the public. You can download that public beta firmware. It won't connect to your Asiomas as of right the second, maybe like in 10 minutes, they'll release something at the last second. <laughs> not but, yet. Uh, <laughs> no, not yet. Cool. Uh, question here about my wife is uh, going to try uh, going to try both the Zwift and the Kicker for the first time tomorrow. What do you suggest for the training difficulty setting? She wants to work out experience, but don't want to scare her. Thanks. Asks David. Um, I'd go defaults. I think the default on Zwift for the training difficulty setting, which isn't 
Uh, well, effectively, the trainer difficulty setting is the gradient simulation setting. So at, by default on Zwift, it's set to about 50% or halfway through, which means if you're going up an 8% gradient, it only really feels like four in the real world. In the virtual world, it's still 8%. So there's a difference there between the physical world and the virtual world and what you feel in the legs. So easy answer to that one. Go defaults and say, so here you go. Yep, I agree. Uh, and it's kind of back on the vector thing, a couple people asked just to kind of similar questions here and there I've seen. Um, the M9ING0G asks, uh, would you pay uh, a premium for the vector three against the Asama Duo? Um, well, Cycling Dynamics is there already with the vector threes. Yep, uh, and it'll be there for the, the Asama soon. Soon, yeah. Um, I think, so anytime people ask like, would you pay sort of questions, it comes down to value. And mm. um, I think at this point, given the price differential and where things are going, it's gonna be really hard to justify the price differential going into January or whenever the cycling dynamics mm. is out there, mm -hmm. um, what is almost twice the price. Like to me, that's a, it's, it's gonna be at 649 right now for Asiomo, it's 999 for Vector. That's a tough pitch, um, I use both. I like both, they were great. I don't have any problems with either, um, but I think it's something that into the spring of next year, especially if like IQ Squared comes along and actually can ship by then. There's a question there about IQ Squared. When do we yep. think they're going to drop and how confident are we? Um, your thoughts on the IQ Squared? Uh, yeah. my, my thing all along has been, I don't, I, I think they'll get there. I have no question they'll get there in terms of getting a product that's functional. And I'll just be clear, when I say get there, I mean actually releasing a usable, accurate product. Um, releasing a product that's not usable and accurate isn't releasing a product, it's just a paperweight. Um, so I have zero question in my mind that they will get there. Uh, the question is when they will get there. And I've kind of said along, I think spring of 2019, I think that's where I would put the, the dice as well right now. So then they're currently slated for mid-Jan? Yeah. I think so we're still looking at least another five, six weeks away. But even at this mean, point. Yeah, there's just no way. Like looking at the numbers and what they've said in the latest car update, like in terms of um, doing tooling and all that stuff over mm -hmm. the hall, like you can do those numbers back in the app and go, <laughs> not a chance for January. They have been pretty good with the updates on their Kickstarter yeah. pro, um, page as well. So they've been fully transparent about the delays. Whilst we don't like delays in things, yep. um, they've been very communicative about what's going on, yeah, which is, yeah, credit to them. They've been using the DC Remicor analysis tool as well. My favorite yeah. website on yeah. the internet. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so, be, oh, go ahead. I said, but to be clear, I have actually no idea what they put in that analyzer tool. Mm -hmm. Like I don't look at any other people's analyzer or things unless you yell at me or say that you need a upset fix or something. Yeah, so, basically you would have to manually publicize it yourself. Right, as, yes. As so, a user. They may be using the tool, but I don't look at the tool. So, mm -hmm. uh, so Becker's R, ours, uh, asks uh, Apple Watch versus all the other stuff. What's your take on it? Well, um, it's really going to come down to a few things. Uh, battery life is going to be number one for sure. Uh, but then it's going to come down to usability as well. So um, with the Apple Watch, yeah, you have the uh, crown and the one physical button, but it can be a little bit more challenging to use in a you know fitness environment or fitness scenario, basically. So um, keep that in mind with it. Um, it is a great device in terms of the heart rate, for sure. Um, but um, again, battery life. Um, and then you may want to check out a video that um, Shane and I did on his channel about <clears throat> the native workout app versus the Strava app and how the GPS can differ a little bit. Um, I don't think it'll be a huge deal for, for most people, but um, uh, do keep that in mind as well. But again, it probably is gonna come down to battery life for the most part. So it depends on the type of activity that you wanna do uh, with it. And then obviously with Garmin and Polars, uh, they're gonna connect to a lot more sensors than an Apple Watch would. So keep that in mind as well. Cool. Uh, Narwhal asks, uh, how are, can Garmin encourage people to develop, monetize, connect IQ apps? The ecosystem of watchOS seems to blow Garmin out of the water, which leads to the Apple Watch being quote <coughs> better, is what he, uh, or, he or she uh, did there. Uh, that's a tough one. I, I've long disagreed with Garmin on their monetization strategy right now. And the way it works today with Garmin Connect IQ apps is you can sort of monetize it, but you have to do it off platform. Uh, so that means that if you had an app that leverages something that's um, outside the platform, then you can pay for that thing outside the platform on their own website, wherever else, and then you authorize the app to use it. And no clunky. one, it's yeah. clunky. No yeah. one really wants to do it. The smaller developers don't want to deal with all that stuff. So Garmin's reasoning for that, and I totally get it, is that they don't want to deal with having this um, a store, an e-commerce type platform to support all that. You deal with currencies and billing, and it's mm. it's really really tricky. Um, 
And so, you know, they want to leave that to someone else. The problem is that that basically impacts them directly the opposite way, which is that those smaller developers, like the one I just mentioned um, for like Health Fit Plus and things like that, um, they don't want to deal with that either. And if you look at who's in a better position to deal with that, is it the massive international company, um, you know, that makes billions of dollars a year, or is it the single developer um, in southern France? Like it's... I don't know. I, I don't think you're going to see the same level of apps that you would see on other platforms until you can monetize them more easily directly on that platform. Yep. Question here from a fat bloke on a bicycle. Well, hopefully if you're on a bicycle more, you won't be such a fat bloke. Yep. It works for me. I lost 15 kilos when I started riding. Uh, Ruby AR, augmented reality. I just tried it out today. Does Zwift have a real competitor now? Mm, tough one. Sort of. I, I like the idea. I like where it's going. Um, and I've always said it'd, it'd be handy, but we're not going to have full headsets yet. So what's what's next? What can we do in between us? You know, having new technology developed for better headsets or lasers on our eyes or something yeah. or other. It's it's a move towards that, and uh, it looks pretty good. Ray, your take on things yesterday after your ride? It's cool. It's not it's not like there yet, and for me, it's tough because I don't typically like to just sit in a trainer and watch the videos, the real course videos. Um, I appreciate them. Like I think like the work that Full Gas did on their videos is stunningly beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, but I get bored really quick. I guess it's just I'm just watching a television screen. And so like I don't even watch movies on, on and TV on the trainer. I'm either like I want an erg workout. I just want to like focus on the erg workout or um, be on Zwift. Like there's no – for me, I don't get – so the problem with the AR stuff as well, as cool as that was, I'm personally still not engaged into mm -hmm. it. It's just kind of one of those things where it's like, oh, that's really cool. I appreciate it. But – for me, it's not my cup of tea. There's no feel to it. And still, right. I, I still want, one thing I do miss indoors is that feel of being on the draft. And again, you said with the virtual pro bike, that was kind of there. And you'll see some people moving around in that space about getting the indoor realism more real. Yep. Um, and I guess it's one thing to have something on the screen to follow along, but it's another thing to get that feel of riding outdoors. So it's probably not there yet, but I do like yeah, the extensibility of that. Imagine having your own climb in your own backyard and your own ghost rider as well there. We'll see what they can do in the future with that. Cool. Uh, let's see. Well, Des finds his next question of choice. So yes. I'll go with uh, actor JR asking, what's the future of Connect IQ? Trying to watch via taxi on the way to the, back to the year report. Uh, some missed response. Um, you know, it's funny. Like In some ways, people will look just like I said a moment ago with the platforms and be like, ah, oh, Apple has all these millions of you know apps and watches and all that stuff. They don't have millions of apps, but you get the point. They have a lot of apps uh, and a lot of watches out there. And Garmin is like the Connect IQ, like, the third or whatever platform out there um but at the same time when like garmin throws up their numbers at, at the end of the year and their conferences on how many you know tens of millions of downloads of these apps are out there and how many millions of devices support these apps you're like that's impressive mm -hmm. um and i i would guess at this point that they have more downloads of apps than fitbit does or at least in the same ballpark somewhere in there despite fitbit have more devices out there Garmin has, I think, more apps that people actually want to download onto their device. So I think I'm going to keep on seeing that, that go forward. Um, I really do think that monetization needs to be a bigger part of it. Um, I would say, we kind of talked about this in our roundtable we went live this morning on like comparing to Wear OS and all that kind of stuff. I think mm -hmm. part of the challenge that Garmin would have, um, some people said, you know, talk about whether they would go into Wear OS and I don't see that at all likely. I think that would be the biggest mistake Garmin could ever make um, because they would not only have to port their entire underlying um, fitness platform. So what you I don't even have a Garmin watch on, what's on your wrist right now, all of the functionality in that would have to be ported first to a, a uh, to Wear OS mm -hmm. and it would have to be in the same exact way that you expected it from a Garmin device. Once that was done, they had to port their entire um, Garmin Connect API platform ecosystem, all the app development onto Wear OS as well, which means that then you can have apps on top. It would just be like this I'm not sure. I think it would they would lose so much there. I don't think that's really the best solution. I think in, even today, if we look at the app differences between an Apple Watch and a um, Wear OS and a Garmin Connect IQ enabled device, the key things that people have been asking for over the years are starting to evaporate in terms of what people needed. So like Spotify integration, right? mm -hmm. that was something that people like, oh, if, if Garmin were on Wear OS, they'd have Spotify. They have Spotify now. Like those are examples where I think Garmin is just going right to source and saying we're going to solve this here as opposed to trying to let someone else do it. So uh, Oliver Young, uh, and I'm actually going <coughs> to go ahead and address Sam Mallory at the same time. So question for Des, I currently have an Apple Watch Series 3 cellular and I was wondering if it was worth upgrading to the Series 4. I'm an avid road and mountain cyclist and then trying out running. Um, for the most part, 
I wouldn't necessarily say so unless you, uh, as Sam said, basically want the bigger screen. The bigger screen really is quite nice. Uh, and I have to say too, I, and the name of the watch face uh, escapes me at this point, but um, the stock watch face that has uh, basically all those complications on it, it's pretty awesome. I, I, I really, really like it. I, I, you know, for me, it's like I have, you know, the Amsterdam time zone on here. I have Melbourne and stuff like that, just so I don't text these guys in the middle of the night or anything like that. Um, so, but uh, yeah, it sounds weird, but the watch face is a big seller for me. Uh, and you can't get that on the, the Series 3. So from a Fitch perspective, they didn't really add <coughs> that much into the Series 4. I mean, the, the, it's, it's Watch OS 5 that they did add um, uh, cadence with it. So basically, for the Series 3 versus the Series 4, um, gosh, I mean, if it's working for you, I would say maybe save your money unless you really want the watch face and the, the bigger display. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's see. You got a question? List up Shane, or let me dive another one here. Chris has asked, will Strava and Zwift one day be one? Uh, no, I don't think so at all. Strava no. and what? Uh, Strava and Zwift. One day be one, as in join companies or merge? I don't think so at all. Zwift yeah. themselves are a totally different company to Strava. Um, and Strava's, again, it's, it's, Strava's a monster. Yep. I think that gets a little bit into like some monster. of the dynamics of, of how those those two entities in particular, of all the entities out there, are funded, right? Mm. I mean, those, those are both cases of essentially Silicon Valley-esque companies, which is a rarity in the sports tech world. Most sports tech companies are generally like smaller, you know, single people that kind of band together to make a company, might get some minor funding out mm -hmm. there versus these are companies, those two companies in particular have raised huge rounds of funding and those investors are looking for a payout. Um, and that's been Strava's problem in large part over the last year to three, two and a half years or so, is that they've grown too big for anyone to buy them out. Um, there's no longer anyone left to buy them out. So you remove the Garmin's equation and stuff like that, and Garmin has no desire to buy them out. So there's not many people that can afford that evaluation. And so in that sort of case, a merger would, would take convincing a lot of investors, mm -hmm. um, especially in the case of Zwift, where they're still, I think, in a place they will look for a buyout if they can get that. Um, but I don't, I think that'd be really, really tough. Uh, let's see, I have one up here a second ago. I just, uh, Chris asks, has Garmin gone too far in pricing for the Phoenix series? Uh, yeah, it's really expensive. I, that's a hard pill to swallow. Um, I don't know. I think it's tough. On one hand, it's tough to say they've gone too far when obviously people are buying them. People, a lot of people are buying them. Their, their fitness division <laughs> has like, is never bigger and better in terms of revenue and all that kind of stuff from an investment standpoint. That's really strong. I don't know. Um, I will say the instinct though is actually an interesting twist on that, right? In a lot of ways, the instinct is the budget Phoenix. Sure. Um, well, yeah. I, I, has the pricing gone too far? Uh, well, here's the thing. You know, with pretty much all devices, I mean, you look at the new, you know, iPhones. They've gone kind of crazy with those too. So. Everything gen generally is increasing on that higher end, uh, but at the same time, again, you know, think about: Do you really need a Phoenix? I think that's 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 one thing that I see a lot in my comments is like, you know, Phoenix versus everything else. Well, uh, you know, consider a nine thirty five, consider a yeah. six forty five. Uh, you don't necessarily need a Phoenix. Um, I, I think I'll, I think a lot of people gravitate to that device because it may be, you know, just the, the you know top end device, but. At the same time, it's a device that's meant for, you know, <laughs> for a higher end audience, I guess you can say in terms of, you know, you need a lot of those fitness features, you know, the power meter support, the durability as well. I mean, the yeah. durability, that's really, I think, probably the number one item where you really need a Phoenix or consider the 645 or the 935 at that point. Yeah, and I think there's, is, while there's never been Garmin watches more expensive than there have been today, in the inverted side of that, there's never been Garmin watches with as much functionality at as low price points as there have been today. Um, you have like the Vivo Active 3 down to uh, 200-ish or so for the holidays and um, Instinct to 299, which is essentially a slightly pared down Phoenix. So I do wish that it was an Instinct option that didn't look like a Casio watch. Yes, absolutely. I think if they made a Phoenix Lite, oh yeah. boy, that would, I think that would be, be cool. an interesting little device, in instinct -ering. Instinct, yeah. Instinct. Alrighty, back to the cycling <laughs> questions. And one I am very qualified in. Have you guys ever cr had a crash? And what did you do uh, while you couldn't ride? Okay, my list of breaks, yeah, four collarbones, a hip, um, and opening up quite a few crashes over the years. Uh, and the first thing I wanted to do is get back on the ergo. So again, a lot of the reason why I'm sitting here today is because I got addicted to the ergo. I was indoors recovering from, uh, well, crashes. Collarbones are an easy one because you can just sort of prop yourself up or I've even been known to strap myself to a, 
uh, cupboard behind me so I didn't sort of lean forward too bad. But um, if you can't ride, you can't ride after a crash. But if you can get on and spin those legs, when you're pumped up with painkillers and you just feel absolutely groggy and horrible, the best thing I could do is get back on the bike. And the worst thing about having a crash, if it's during competition, it's when you are at the most fittest as well. So you get that fitness and then you're just sitting around doing nothing and you just feel really lethargic. You just, so that if, as soon as you can get on the bike, as soon as your medical people tell you can, don't get on the internet and ask, and don't take my advice. As soon as the professionals say it's okay to get on the bike, get on the trainer and just spin the legs. An hour of just turning the legs, getting that blood flowing. That was the best thing I could have done uh, for all of my number of breaks. It, but it definitely happens. Um, uh, funny story, I actually broke my toe um, during an unboxing video earlier this year. Get out <laughs> of here. Yeah, absolutely. What Only product more. was it? Let's, let's run it. What pro- <laughs> <laughs> it was actually during the Apple Watch Series 4 unboxing. I had to How run. How did you kick it? Huh? Was it that bad? Well, my phone was ringing in the other room. I ran. Oh, okay. So it wasn't the box kicked... of the product that you were unboxing. You broke no. Your toe. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like, you know, I opened the box and my toe suddenly just spontaneously broke. And like <laughs> but uh, no, I had to run to the other room. I kicked the corner of the wall and hey, I broke my toe. Uh, but, you know, that happens. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it's uh, just getting back on the bike. I mean, I, I couldn't necessarily run. I, I did try to run um, uh, for a test, but, uh, you know, just again, I could squeeze my foot into a bike shoe, got on the trainer and a great resource for indoor training, of course. And uh, yeah, you just get those legs moving somehow. Uh, Forrest asks, is the Hammerhead crew on life support? Will they ever support apps? Uh, I don't think it's on life support, no. I think they're, they're chugging along. Um, I think they need, to, they need to refresh the hardware. It's as simple as that. Um, I think they're, they've gotten to the point where while the hardware is only like a year old in terms of when they started shipping it, even less than that, it's like I guess, eight months or something like that, uh, or about 10 months roughly. Uh, I think that's a challenging thing because it's really like two years old when they look at when they started their entire campaign, which is roughly... Um, May of 2017 or something like that. So, you know, you're, you're talking like older hardware and in particular for them, the biggest issue in the hardware was the lack of the audio buzzer beeper thing. Um, so for a device that's meant for navigation, lacking that is really tough. It's also a pretty big clunky device. Um, they're doing good work there, but I think they're finding some of the challenges of uh, death by a thousand cuts, right? In terms of everyone wants the feature they expect on their, their head unit, whether it's a Garmin or a Wahoo or whatever the case is. And when that feature doesn't exactly match or isn't there, people are like, oh, and everyone has their own like 1% feature. Like there's maybe a feature that I'm like, if that's not there, I'm taking this and throwing it, my, it does his toe. And if, <laughs> if someone- The other one. <laughs> yeah, and then someone else is like, I'm throwing it the other does his toe. Um, and it's so true, like I, it's really hard to, to show that until you look at the comment sections of like my reviews or anything like that to see how people are, are so focused on their one little feature, which there's nothing at all wrong with that. We all have our own little features, um, but it's really tough for a company to enter this space and not have that 10 years or so of, of those 1% features being added in and nuances of stuff like that. So I think they need to basically just reiterate their hardware, uh, refresh the hardware with some, some stuff there and see where that goes. Yeah, Alan asks about what do we think of the health of the cycling industry uh, since the cancellation of Interbike 2019? Uh, probably the best one for Ray to answer that one, but I have seen a few people from a few companies being disappointed with the cancellation of Interbike, but they were from companies who didn't support Interbike this year. So just as if you didn't vote, you can't complain. I would, it's a very interesting one. I think the industry itself is to blame for this one. That's my take on things. A lot of big companies weren't there to support the event, so they can't turn around and say, well, it's not there anymore. We see a lot of people do, or a lot of companies, do their own events now and become islands. Yep. We see, to name names, you see Specialized doing their own launches. You see other companies doing their own launches themselves as individual islands. And whilst they can do that, fine, the industry's big enough for them to do that, that hurts the small players. And one thing I was talking about today over lunch is the guys from Crown Rollers. If you remember my video from uh, Interbike, and we all saw those Crown... Uh, there's a small group, of, like two group of... Sorry, two guys, small company, had a little individual setup of different rollers I'd never seen before and I went over there and I'm like guys that's not going to work and it was a phenomenal product they were kickstarter funded because they were at Interbike mm. so for me the larger companies getting away from Interbike and those things it doesn't give the smaller teams enough to, uh, you know, exposure for their own little product so I think it's not going to hurt the industry as such for the big teams it's the smaller players I'm worried about though absolutely yeah. so Ray your take on this the health of the industry yep. um, given today's news I think the industry it's funny it's how you define the industry is the important part mm-hmm. are you defining the industry as local bike shops are you defining Ooh, the industry as the um, entities like the, the manufacturers really the, the stuff that we tend to deal with the mm-hmm. most mm-hmm. are you defining the industry as whether consumers are buying stuff from both things um, I think it depends. And we saw that with even like the, the press release from Interbike. They talked about like the state of the industry and this and that. And um, 
from our perspective, like if I do it from a sports text perspective, um, the state of the industry has never been stronger. There's never been more players in the industry right now producing more stuff, making more stuff, and, and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. has never been stronger than been at this point in time uh, selling more stuff. So that's really strong. If I look at the opposite side, which is what Interbike in particular is looking at, the retailer side of it, the local bike shops, that's probably n- never been less strong, or whatever the right word is, or it's never been this, <laughs> this poor. Um, so it's really tough. But it definitely, to, to Shane's point, it's going to impact the small guys, not the retailers so much, um, because they'll find their information somewhere else. They'll mm-hmm. find it on, on YouTube. They'll find their information wherever they want to. But it's all those smaller companies that may only have you know, 1 to 20 employees um, that aren't going to get the exposure they want. And that was their event, to, to yeah. talk to people effectively like us and, and others. So I'm going to take two easy ones here. Um, Shahamat um, says, um, speaking of the instincts, remarks on the display, isn't it too small? Yeah, I think that um, they may have maybe put a little bit too much plastic on the outside, and uh, they could have maybe made the display a little bit bigger on that one. So, yeah, I think I said that in uh, either the first or second roundtable. Um, and then, uh, let's see here. Um, <laughs> Mark asked, uh, in terms of the vibration, um, for me, I can feel the Apple Watch Series 4 vibration extremely well. So basically he asked, um, you know, is it easy to feel the watch when you're essentially, um, when your arm is not still? And, yeah, for me, um, they have quite a bit of variability in terms of the haptic feedback that comes off of the watch or the vibration. Um, so for me, I can nearly always feel it. Yeah. So. Okay. Question from Eric regarding which trainer to get for the Apple TV, the H2 by Cyclops or the Wahoo? I would, given the Apple TV has a restriction of only, well, three Bluetooth devices, one's taken up by the remote and you've only got two extra Bluetooth devices. So you've got hopefully your trainer, heart rate, cadence sensor, it, like, it gets a bit hard. Uh, the Wahoo trainers themselves don't transmit cadence. So you've got a choice with Apple TV to go either a separate cadence sensor or your heart rate straps. So I would probably put Wahoo to, a, to the side just for that. H2 does um, power, cadence, <coughs> and controllable trainer, leaving the extra, and that's all in one Bluetooth channel, leaving the extra Bluetooth channel for your heart rate strap. I'd add the Neo and the Neo 2 to that as well yeah. because the Neo transmits uh, cadence. And I so, want to say that like in that, like the whole like Wahoo not transmitting cadence, they're the only one left that doesn't do that, I think, uh, right? It is, and somebody was asking today, why didn't we give Wahoo more of a hard time for that because of the non-Apple TV support? For me, it's an Apple TV problem. It's not really a Wahoo problem because on the Mac, on the PC, on my phone, it's not a problem. We compare multiple Bluetooth devices. So for yeah. me, it's an Apple TV problem, but the way to get around that is to choose the right trainer for the task. I will say that to me, like my, if I was late at a bar and somebody asked me that question, um, I would say Wahoo's lazy. Right? Okay. I would say at this point, Wahoo's been talking about pulling in cadence in one shape or another now since their first introduced to kicker, like what was that? 2014? Yeah, 2014, six, I can't do math. Four, no, it's more than four years. Is it? No, it's 2012. Ooh. Yeah, 2012 was just when I first, uh, I, a long time ago. Many, many <laughs> years they've been doing this. They've been talking about doing this and they haven't done it yet. They even include the darn cadence sensor in the in box. The box. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. how it's, it'd be so trivial for them to pair that on Amp Plus Pass that over yeah, um, through the through. kicker and bridge it through. Like, that's what they've talked about. Mm. Come on, guys. You've been talking about this for years now. You you spend the money to put that thing in there. Like, let people use it. Um, so, yeah. So, i got a question for both of you coming from Paul. <laughs> hey, Paul. Uh, he <laughs> says, Shane, De- Shane days. Shane and Des, have you been, <laughs> you have been in the Netherlands a week now. What do you think the Dutch can teach the world uh, cycling, running, uh, like a scene, and what do you what what do they still need to learn? We'll let you go first. I felt very small over here. We were at an event last night, and uh, so the people are tall. It's the, they can't teach us to be tall, but that's <laughs> one thing I've noticed. Everyone is so tall over here. Um, cycling in general, just as a mode of transport. Again, to to sit on sort of the high horse of you know cycling is great. As just about everyone rides, it's not the exception. Where I'm from in Melbourne, if you ride a bike, you're the commuter, you're the guy who commutes to work and you're sort of over there in the world, you know, you're known as the guy, everyone rides bikes. And mm-hmm. it's just a mode of transport. The cargo bike you ride around mm-hmm. in, it's just useful, it works really well. So I guess what they could teach people, you know, teach city planners, plan the infrastructure better Absolutely. and people yeah. will ride. Mm-hmm. Um, and today it was pouring down rain. Guess what, everyone's still riding around. Mm-hmm. They had coats over their handlebars and just riding along, so. Um, yeah, that's about all I have on that one. Um, so I actually come from Fort Collins, Colorado. So um, we're one of the top three uh, best cycling cities in the United States, and uh, it's it's fantastic there. But coming here, um, I didn't necessarily know what to expect, and I was absolutely blown away at the culture. Um, it's it's very interesting. Uh, this is something that you know Ray and I were talking about that um, everyone cycles here, and uh, it's kind of one of those things where there's just a flow to the cycling community here in terms of like you know just in terms of how actually people get around. Um, 
people, you know, everybody's kind of, you know, going somewhere with an intent. <laughs> and uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, people don't necessarily uh, yell at each other in terms of, you know, if somebody gets in somebody else's way. It's just incredibly friendly. And then the skill. Oh, the skill. Oh, oh it's, my gosh. It's, have you ever seen ice skating in the Olympics where they cross over and like, well, they nearly crashed. Mm-hmm. Everybody has that skill here. Yeah. Not not crashing, but like perfectly in heart. I, whoa. Yeah, I mean, I'm absolutely blown away. And um, uh, what's what's amazing too is that I think that friendliness. Oh my gosh! I mean, the the Dutch culture is just. I, I'm I, I'm just like smitten. I guess you could say in terms of how friendly everyone is here. Um, and and that's the thing. It's like you know, we've gone to different restaurants. We went to that event last night. It was a it was a Zwift event and. Um, I couldn't feel more at home here. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Free beers and pizza help. Oh, yes, absolutely. At the event last night. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Noah asks, do you guys think that sports or fitness tech has actually helped the average person be better or reach their goals? Uh, mm-hmm. Interested in the different regional perspectives from you all. Um, for me, I think absolutely. Like Even if I just ignore everything I've done from like a DCR perspective and talk about like my own personal experience, Sports tech is like what got me into running and not directly like I wanted to try all the different things out. It was buying an old Polar watch and just starting off with uh, basically, you know, repeating the same routes every single, uh, I was the least you know, like structured training plan ever for my first running. I just went out and ran this eight mile loop and I ran the same thing every other day. Um, and just, I used a, a simple watch with a little extra GPS pod, uh, or actually that was an extra foot pod uh, first to capture how my pace was and to look at that afterwards on the old polar desktop software like now that's all even better people can look where they ran i think for a lot of people sports tech like on the running side is about finding a way to better what they did yesterday and seeing what they did and capturing that and saying yeah i'm running a little bit faster than yesterday a little bit better yourself yeah you don't have to compete with cycling is such a well the elite cycling is a very sort of clicky little group and you can be and only ever one person can win it gets a bit uh how fast are you going what's your ftp you can really throw that away with new tech. Yeah. Measure yourself. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that's yeah. what I found as well. Yeah. No, absolutely. I think, I mean, getting actionable data that you can actually improve on is, is extremely important for sure in, in terms of performance. But, you know, at the same time, don't necessarily ignore the experience either. You know, it's like, again, sports and, and fitness. It's I'll, like, I'll tell you a story about that. Yeah, Coming sure. uh, midwinter, I was just doing Llama lab tests as my main rides. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking, okay, that's all I need to do. Llama lab tests, get up every morning, test this, put this here, this, uh, this. Uh, I forgot about riding my bike. Exactly. I really did. Exactly. And it was this sort of middle of winter, it was a bit depressing i'm like i'm gonna go out and ride more sheep patrols mm-hmm. like okay i'm gonna start tracking my things and i've started tracking my little tss and that's now going up and up and up and up and up and that's motivating for me to get outside and experience riding the bike rather than just head down in the data mm-hmm. you can overload with data mm-hmm. and again talking about consolidation yeah. of certain feature sets and software it's also same with hardware you don't want to buy a new watch and have to do more things mm-hmm. if you can buy a watch and do less things mm-hmm. our phones and our cameras and uh, well, they have our pay cards as well with playlists and music and things. So we've seen the phone whoosh, come right down to one device. We need to make sure our new tech also does that. Oh, absolutely. And it's seamless. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Nick asks, any more reviews in the pipe for any of you on rocker platforms for bike trainers? Um, I'm waiting on this guy to do one. News on when a Cyclops model will be released. Uh, so working backwards to this question, uh, and I'll dump it on Shane. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, Cyclops model, they've always kind of talked sometime 2019 or so. My guess is probably springish. Uh, I think the challenge for them right now is figuring out uh, how to take all the feedback they have back in there. And, and what to call it. What to call it to be a good name? start. Um, how to price it. Uh, I, I suspect folks, I don't want to say we disappointed in the price there, but I think it's going to be a challenge for them to reach a price point that uh, people can get on board with uh, mm-hmm. no pun intended um and so <laughs> um that's that'll be interesting yeah that is it's still downstairs uh, i use it every once in a while mm-hmm. um there are a few models down the road from where the unit i have downstairs is right now um we just haven't figured out how to get back to them because <laughs> it takes like it was delivered via a giant semi truck and pallets and it was crazy um so it's just sitting there until they figure that out but uh i I am interested in rocker plates, but not like over the moon interested in rocker mm-hmm. plates. I think for me, uh, what I liked about the Cyclops one is that it just moves a little bit, a little subtlety in movement that you're like, oh, I'm, I'm kind of just rolling along and I'm with it and not, my butt is in the exact same place in the saddle. That's to me the interest. I think once we get into sprinting, we'll let Shane go from there. Mm, no, uh, not what they sort of sell in a lot of the promo of these devices, especially for sprinting. You, you're never going to be able to perfect your sprinting technique indoors. 
um, on one of these plates or on anything really. Indoors is about just power to the legs and the cardio. Outdoors is where you perfect your technique because there's so much going on outdoors, especially at 1,000 watts, 1,500 watts with the bike moving around, with the concentration forward. That's if you, you can really tell if someone's learnt to sprint on an indoor trainer, their bike will be solid and they'll be over the top. There's a technique, you watch the pros, that's where you learn how to, your technique, or find a coach, it'll take you outside to do that. Rocket plate just can't do that. One observation from the DCR Open Cave night was that we had a few different stations set up for the night. We had the Climb, we had the Neo 2, with the, or the Kicker 18. Um, with the climb and then the Neo 2 set up, we had a few other trainers and we also had a trainer set up on the rocker platey thing. It really wasn't the go-to device. People weren't mm. mulling around going, whoa, there were a Eurobike because it was new, it was brand new, it was one of the showpieces there. But you know, when the general consumer comes in or the DCR fan yeah. comes in, everyone was just like, okay, cool, cool. It really wasn't the go-to. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a I think there's some interesting behind the scenes reasons for that too, like in terms of why people weren't like, wow, <clears throat> what is that? Partly because they don't know it exists. Good point. There's no website for there's it. No is website. there only there's, your posts on yeah, it? Yeah, there's no website. Yeah. There's just R2 posts and a few random other things here and there. Yeah. But there's no website. There's no name. There's no um, target. There's like, uh, to me, if you're going to announce, a, if you're going to show a product at a major trade show, the biggest trade show of the year for somewhere, like have a name. Don't One that still exists as well. You're yep, even there. call it Prototype X, right? <laughs> Pull in the car <laughs> thing, right? And just say this is Prototype X, a Cyclops Prototype X. And have Top it be there. secret. Yeah, and say, <laughs> show everyone. Yeah. have a website for it, have a thing that people yeah. can find information. The number of comments I get every single week on YouTube videos, mm -hmm. uh, even this morning, in fact, um, people going, hey, what was that thing that you were going on the, on the video? You were back and forth. And it's like, there's not even a brand of Cyclops on there. Like, send me some stickers. I'll stick it on there if you mm -hmm. want. But um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, let's see. Stanley asks, uh, will you review the giant power meter in the future? If we can get one. Yeah, maybe. We haven't, we haven't seen them, have we? They're I haven't seen them. Uh, only on no. the bike themselves. Only on the bike. Um, yeah, I mean, let's just see how that works out and see like if it's accurate. I haven't seen any any reviews talk about accuracy at all, let alone any that I would trust. So, yeah, we'll see there. I, we still don't know what it is either. We believe yeah. it's, a, it's a hybrid Pioneer of some type or adopted from the Pioneer. It's, well, it's a Shimano crank set. It's a Shimano crank set. So, it's hard to know. Yeah. yeah, I'm we'll very surprised Giant themselves, if I was Giant, I'd have someone come out and just, re even Giant themselves, put out a promo of what mm -hmm. the power meter actually is. It's a selling point on the bike, yeah. it's quite cheap, it doesn't add a lot of more cost to the bike itself, and it's part of the integrated process, as I was talking about before. If you buy new technology, you don't want to have to get another service and this and that. If you were to buy a brand new bike and it had everything integrated on already, which this bike does, the power meter, it's a good selling point. So Giant just need to sort of start ringing their own bell, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So uh, KDAT uh, asks, conversely, when fitness tech fails, bad data, no uh, slow GPS <laughs> connection, flat battery, do you think it discourages someone from taking that step out of the door? Um, I think it can, absolutely, but I think it may go back to just going and going out for a ride. I mean, you know, I get just, depressed when things don't work. If my yeah, computer, sure. if, if I log in and Swift crashes, mm -hmm. Table flip. Yeah, I'm absolutely. really gonna have my, my um. You know, I was an example of that. Was even I had dropouts the other day in the mm -hmm. Llama Lab, 10:30 at night, final Llama Lab test for the day. Trying to click some data for the last review, couldn't mm -hmm. do it. Yeah, very unhappy times. Oh, but again, that's my problem that I need to deal with, mm -hmm. and just continue to ride my bike as a training session. So yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it, funny enough, when Ray and I were testing out the DJI drones, um, I had a watch on that would not get GPS, and you know, consistently would basically. So and what watch was that? <laughs> <laughs> The uh, most popular. <laughs> it says it's the most popular video. It is. Um. Yeah, there's going to be plenty of stuff about it. <laughs> but, uh, but anyways, I mean, you know, at that point, I didn't necessarily <laughs> test any devices, and we just kind of went out for a ride, and then we did our drone yeah. test, and you know, it, it wasn't a big deal. Just again, you know, enjoy the experience if your tech fails. You know, and you know, indoor, it's definitely a little bit different, probably. But um, yeah. Again, it's like, just try to enjoy the experience. Yeah, yeah I'm like Shane, though. I get super frustrated. When I, when I set off the night or of the day, whatever time of day it is, and I set to go start to do a test for something, and things just start like cascading, falling apart, or not working. And it's not just one thing that fails. It's never one thing. No, it's, it absolutely, yeah. I get super frustrated. Cause it's not so much like that, oh, I couldn't go for this social ride. For mm. us, it's, it's like a part of what you have to do. So it's one of those things where it's like, well, now I can't get something else done. Or now this is holding up review, or it's holding up something else because I'm missing this data set. Uh, it's super frustrating. So I got up here. Um, 
Ramon asks, are you getting tax Christmas drink bottles? Oh, I got one the other day. You got one. They're really cool. Yeah, yeah. I think they're super cool. They're called the um, the ugly sweater drink bottles. Yeah. They're <laughs> awesome. Whole, yeah. They've got about five or six different ones. If you have a look on the tax experience Instagram post, I think they put up the, all the all the bottles the other day. I should have just filled my bag full of them. Yeah. They are super cool. Um, I only got one. Yeah. Not as cool as some other bottles, no. Oh, um, but, oh dang. <laughs> so it's funny. We, we, we got these for um, the DCR open house last weekend. Uh, uh, we don't know how we're going to like get them online, to be honest. So we bought them all. The tax didn't actually send these to us or anything. We bought them through the normal process of buying water bottles. They were made by tax here in the Netherlands, just really close by. Um, the girl did the design for them, so she did it herself. And they're just, they match like the DCR kits. But we haven't figured out like how to get these, make them available because they're kind of expensive to ship this sort of thing. Mm. So there's a lot of air. In a lot of air. Um, mm. It's not like a sticker. So we're mm. gonna figure that out eventually. Um, but uh, yeah, some some interesting stuff coming there. Let's see. Where else down the question? So many questions. Uh, Narwhal Newman, Newman asks: Are you? Uh, are any of you interested in the DJI Osmo Pocket? Thoughts of usefulness versus mm. the GoPro Hero <laughs> Seven? It looks, yes, it looks cool. Uh, interested for sure, absolutely. Um, so little tiny, uh, it's it's about probably half the size of the drink oh, bottle. There, very small, a, very small, absolutely. and it's it's gim- it has a gimbal or it has. It is a, it's just the tiniest little gimbal out there. It's just it's exactly like a gimbal, only smaller. It's um, really so, tiny. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, extremely so, interesting device. Four um, K sixty. Uh, I don't know the actual four K. So I thought it was yeah four K sixty. Four K. Yeah, possibly. Um, but. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I think uh, the size is fascinating for sure, um, as well as the price. Um, however, the accessories that come with it, or <laughs> not come with it, pardon me, that are upgrades, it piles up considerably. I mean, considerably. So, you know, when you're talking about the GoPro Hero 7 Black being at $400, not necessarily the best deal, but still much cheaper than accessorizing the DJI Osmo, Osmo Pocket for sure. Um, yep. But again, we talk about uh, durability. So, you know, with the Osmo Pocket, it's still a gimbal. So if you take a crash, if you're mountain biking or road biking for that matter, you could damage it. The mm-hmm. Hero 7, I've taken some crashes. It's actually during the testing for <laughs> Shane's yep. collab video and it's perfectly fine. So uh, again, there's very much a trade off, but yeah, I think both, I mean, especially Ray and I are both interested in it. Yeah, we're, we've been talking a lot about it. I think I'm fascinated by the size of it. I think it's definitely the first really strong shot over the bow of GoPro um, by DJI. I guess maybe it's the second. The first was killing the drones, but uh, the first, the second would be this here. And, and and we talked about this again this morning. I think in the other roundtable um, that published this morning on Shane's cha- channel on like action camera and sports tech. Um, I would hope that GoPro understands the severity of what DJI has done here. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Like um, they've put out something that software wise exceeds what GoPro is doing. Uh, like the active tracking with mm-hmm. the gimbal is super cool. The fact that we could be riding together and I just tap you and it follows you, your As head automatically yeah, is yeah. really cool while I'm just holding it. Um, you can't do that with the traditional GoPro you know, gimbal. You have to change the direction automatically or manually. Um, mm-hmm. I'm super excited to try it out. I've got orders in for those. Hopefully show up next week sometime, maybe sooner. Um, so yeah, that'll be that'll be really fascinating. Uh, I don't think it's a replacement for Hero 7 today, as no. it stands, mm-hmm. but it is a replacement for a lot of people. Yes. Um, so it's kind of like I was talking this morning a little bit how Strava doesn't directly compete with Zwift, mm-hmm. but in some cases they compete for that same pile of money, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. it's saying like if you only have X amount to give to an online training service per month or year or whatever, you're effectively starting to compete for that same pile mm-hmm. of money. And this is the same thing. If you only have X amount for a camera, you're going to be looking at both those, a Hero 7 and a uh, Osmo Pocket and going, which one fits my budget and uh, fits my requirement the best. So super, super fascinating <laughs> stuff. So Oliver has somewhat of a related question. I'll just tackle it fast. Do you guys think that the GoPro Hero 7 Silver and White were a bit of a cash, bag from, uh, cash grab from GoPro? Um, I think watch the end of um, episode one, I believe. For, uh, yeah, the round table uh, for that one, but over on my channel. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Over on uh, GB Lama's channel, and then uh, also, will we be seeing any new gimbals for <laughs> GoPro, GoPro Karma 2.0? I can't necessarily answer that question. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't have any information there. I would say um, there's no chance of a Karma drone. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. that, that project is dead in the water. Um, I would hope there's a second gimbal. I think that's required. I think it'd be nice to get like a shorty version of that gimbal. Sure, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I would say the one the one pro to the, the GoPro gimbal, aside from you have to put a GoPro in it, uh, is it is super durable. Mm-hmm. I have dropped that thing so many times. I dropped it off the back of a road bike on the concrete at uh, more than 20 miles an hour. It's fine. Mm-hmm. It, it's a beast. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, any final thoughts on Zwift Run? Is there a market for virtual running? That's a very interesting one. Zwift went pretty hard um, introducing 
virtual running or running on treadmills within Zwift. I think they've already built the world, they've built the infrastructure. So adding running wasn't a lot of extra work. It was John's spare time, I think, the lead mm. developer there at Zwift. Um, I don't think it's as big as what they thought it may have been. Um, they've given out, I think, a thousand foot pods via slow twitch the other day. Very that was quickly. incredible. Forty-five yeah. minutes. Um, yeah, but to get people on Zwift running, to give out a thousand treadmills, and that's the problem. I think treadmills are large. They're clunky. Um, they all do a little bit. You know, they take up a lot of space. Yep. Um, and price range, $500 entry point, right up to $5,000 plus. Look, one thing that uh, Eric Min did say, CEO of Zwift did say um, on one of the latest Zwift casts was that biking is handy for Zwift because you've got your hands. You can, you, it doesn't, it's not fully encompassing. When you're running, you can't really interact. There's no real mm -hmm. social aspect of Zwift running. Um, so I think that's a challenge. Um, also, a lot of people on the running machines, you're at gyms. And if you're at a gym, you're on the running machine for maybe five or 10 minutes. Um, you're not going to pull out a Zwift session just for that five or ten minutes because you're going to be on the CrossFit machine. You're going to be on something else next. So I'm not quite sure even the gyms will adopt it pretty quickly. A <coughs> tough yeah. one. It does. What I found with Zwift running on a phone, couldn't do it because it's just too small. It's I wasn't small. until I had a big screen in front of yes. me and I felt the road it felt like I was actually running somewhere. Mm -hmm. Then it was okay. I could yeah. get it done. Yeah. But there is a very big disconnect from running versus riding on Zwift, especially with the social interaction. You can't even message anybody when you're yep. doing this. Yeah, so. you can do it on an iPad at a gym hotel, but or a gym thing, but the challenge there is like, a lot of gym things aren't super stable. It's like, yeah. you wanna put your iPad there, bouncing around, yeah. and boom, and then you step yeah. on it. By the time off. you've logged yeah. in and paired your device and then saved your file and chosen your screenshot and you wanna be lifting weights instead, it can get, sometimes people just wanna work out. Get the fitness thing done. Yeah, I think. Um, you, so I think, yeah, I think you brought up a really good point just about the experience. Just that you know, it's like you know, on a phone, that's not that great of experience. iPad, it's better. Big screen, it's awesome. I think yeah. it's worth having that because again, the investment they've already built the world, they've built the virtual everything. So to add it there is not too much, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's going to take over the world. Um, let's look at what Peloton are up to. Peloton <coughs> have added running, yeah. mm -hmm. um, but Peloton only for their cycling. Peloton bought out a yoga mat the other day. Mm -hmm. I wonder how much that costs. <laughs> Probably more than the bike. Probably. Uh, <laughs> Subscription service yoga mat. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> mental note, GP Lama business ideas. <laughs> uh, let's see, Albert Albert Tosin, uh, Albert Tosin um, asks, is there any way of comparing power meter run numbers with bike numbers? Ooh. I mean, do you can you compare heart rate numbers with what you, he says you can compare heart rate numbers with whichever sport you do, um, but mm -hmm. don't think you can compare them with the same with power specifically run. No, and that's part of the challenge. And I don't. I would say no with the, the side dish of we don't know yet. Um, in the sense that right now, if I look at running power, like if I talk about the four main players in running power, so you got Polar, Garmin, Stride, uh, and Run Scribe are the ones that have products in market today that people can use. Uh, there's been some other like ancillary ones. There's a handful more, but those are like the big four, if you will. Um, they're all different. So. Like right now, most of the time anyways, I can go on my bike and I can put four power meters on there and get within a percent or two the same numbers. If I wear those same four running devices uh, at the same time, I'm getting dramatically different numbers mm. uh, for those. And not just like 1%, 2%, not even 5%, 10%, but like 30%, 40%, 50%, 60%. I mean, sometimes even double, like it's nuts. And so I don't see... I don't see how like even coaches could deal with that. Like how does a coach, if you're coaching athletes, how do you... Uh, well, all your athletes need to be wearing the, the same, same exact devices. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. I, don't, I don't think so. I, which isn't to say I hate running power. Um, and I think I've probably got more like negative on it over the years. Um, probably because the more I see it and the more I use it and the more I understand about it, the less I trust in it, mm -hmm. um, which sounds like the backers of what it should be. Like it should be like cycling power where you start off being like, I don't know what that thing is. And then yeah. eventually like, I totally get it. After a few months of riding, like, okay, I kind of <laughs> understand where I am. And then a few years, you're like, I know my numbers for the situation. I'm doing the inverse of that in running. Well, yeah. I think the other issue too is uh, what a discussion we had this week basically is usability with running power as well. So it's, you know, with cycling, you can see the number in front of you while you're cycling. Having to do this running, it's, is... it's it's tough. I mean, you can basically analyze your data later if you want to, but it's you know kind of hard to say, okay, you know, this is exactly where the hill was, or this was exactly where I was sprinting. It's you know, it's kind of hard to line that up a little bit. And then you know, when you're running, it's like, are you going to really be doing this the entire time? That's, that's some people kind of... love it. There are some good stories about get people sure. doing PRs, but I think it's more of um, response pacing yes yeah. so whether it's a pacing device and a bit of a placebo eh, we shall see <laughs> okay. uh, let's see Earl asked do you still like the Elite Diretto um, yeah that's a great little unit but I think it's overpriced simply put so I think uh, at this day in it's tough to recommend an Elite Diretto at 849 with a kicker core 899 and the kicker core is silent has better flywheel um, characteristics 
It's got barely better support and apps barely. It's kind of a wash. The Elite does come with a small front wheel block, but you can get that for five bucks on Amazon. Mm -hmm. So it's a tough, a tough thing. I think if the Elite was down to seven ninety nine, mm -hmm. then you have a much better competition between them and the Flux from from Tax. Um, but Elite does have their Zumo, which they've been you know trying to get some last minute things kind of worked out. That's a six ninety nine, mm -hmm. so that becomes super appealing. It's basically like a mini Doretto, um, and if they can resolve the kind of two outstanding issues that I've, I've had with it, and they're they say they're really close on that, so hopefully that'll happen in the next couple of days or maybe a week or two at most. Mm -hmm. uh, that could be really interesting. So uh, let's see here. Mario asks, uh, do you guys think the Phoenix 5 series has enough storage for music? Um, personally, me, yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I guess it really depends like uh, how much music do you really need to store in your device for what type of activity. So, you know, for me, if I am going to be biking and if I'm carrying my phone, I don't necessarily use the music that's on my watch. I actually just use it through my phone just because it's, I think, a little bit, you know, more consistent connection. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, it, you have a little bit more availability. It's uh, maybe a little bit... Uh, not necessarily as easy to use, but you still have music controls on your watch that can still control your phone. So, um, you know, I guess if you want to dump your entire collection on there, maybe it might not work for you. But um, uh, again, I think it um, it depends. It's like, are, are you going for a 12 hour ride? Well, maybe you might not be able to get 12 hours of yeah. music on there. So um, again, I think, you know, just in terms of the type of activity that you're doing, that's probably going to depend on, yeah, that's how it's going to work. And I think just to clarify for folks, you're referring to the Phoenix 5 Plus. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, there's no storage on the Phoenix 5. Yes. So it's not like a question of if it can sort of thing. Mm -hmm. The Phoenix 5 X does have storage, but it doesn't sound like it has the right Bluetooth components to make that all happen. Um, or at least that's what Garmin says. So I think that ship, either way, that ship has sailed. It's, it's definitely <laughs> over. Uh, so one question for, for me here from Oliver. Uh, I lived in the Netherlands for eight years and love the riding. What do you uh, like about most about riding over there? Um, I, for me, the fact that I can ride and not have to worry about cars, which not really have to worry about. I'm like, the culture here is such that cars understand cyclists because every driver is a cyclist. Mm -hmm. right? Where in the U.S. that isn't the case. In the U.S., you're a driver first and a cyclist maybe. Um, and even if you are a cyclist, you're not usually on the roads. Like most people that cycle in the US, it's on bike paths for the weekend, ride for you know five or 10 miles and back again. Totally different than being out on the, the roads with cars, moving fast past them. Here, one, I can stay in bike lanes the vast majority of the time anyways. Even if I'm out in the countryside for miles and miles and hours and hours, it's just pretty bike lanes they're, they're awesome but if I do have to go on the road like we were out on a ride uh, uh, actually you know Vaughn came with us uh, what two days ago or something mm -hmm. like that out in the countryside and yeah some cars came past us and even came past us fairly quickly um, even head on in both directions <laughs> but so I had to explain to these guys I'm like <laughs> just stay the course I'm like whatever you do hold your just line. hold your line hold stay your the line. course and both sides of that equation know how it works out mm -hmm. if you do something stupid then something bad will happen but you, once you understand that then it's it, Beautiful. There's a flow to it. There's mm. a flow. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Question here from Ants and Brooks. Uh, is there a power meter package I can buy my wife? One that's like in a box with everything you need. <coughs> Good question. And you've just described most of the power meter pedal packages. Yep. Uh, depending on if your wife uh, uses cleats on her, uh, or clipless pedals, I think they call them, uh, for locking into the actual pedals themselves, that'd be the way to go. So something that doesn't require insulation tools, so the P1s on cheap. Uh, P1s have been on down to 639, I think, on sale. They might yeah. be there at the moment. Yeah. Uh, oh, the P1s, yeah. P1s, the P2s, uh, the Ferrero Asiomas, the Vector 3s. Um, so there are a few of your options there. You can buy a power meter in a box. That's all you need. Plug them in, away you go. Pretty cool little solution. No bottom brackets to worry about. No yeah. crank lengths to worry about. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the neat thing about power meter pedals. Just works. Mm. Uh, Aaron asks the easiest question of the night. Um, what are you looking for in sports tech in 2019? Uh, I would say that they need to look at Shane's channel, GP Lama, um, linked somewhere down the bottom description right there. Check out this and one. Uh, yep, check out today's post, today's yeah, video. That's our round table number two, where we discuss everything we talked about the day prior, which was <clears> our, what was our best tech of 2018, or best tech that we had in 2018. Number of topics, probably 10 or so different areas, power meters and smart trainers and action cams and things and watches. Um, and then today we spoke about where we hope to see that technology go or improve or be just you know, talked about. Because we can talk about what's out now. Nothing really has wowed us or surprised us. Sure. You know, we sort of discuss what might be coming in the long-term future as well, what we hope to see. So jump over. That's over on my channel. Um, yeah, interesting chat. Cool. 
Uh, Bicycle Sunday asks, how much space, computer, or other devices need to be better um, for basically running apps down the road? So he asks, is Apple TV 32 enough or 64? I think 32 would be fine yeah, for a long that. time. 32 gig is a lot of data, and we don't see things blowing out to the size of Fortnite with downloadable content and things mm-hmm. on Xboxes, yep. um, which take you know, gigs and gigs of downloads. So I think 32, you'll be a few years yet. Well, the 32 will be obsolete before you fill it up. Yeah, I, I bought all 32s. Uh, I didn't... I don't... The only app I have on there is is Zwift, I think. I mean, maybe like Nest or some of the small, tiny apps, but nothing. If you're doing like gaming or something else on it, then reconsider. But if it's just as your Zwift slash whatever, you know, consuming man and media machine, just yeah, go with 32. Good to go. Oliver also asks, can you plug a Ant Plus USB dongle into the back of an Apple TV? No, no. Um, even with the adapters and things you can get for, no, there's no support for the uh, USB dongle on Apple, either iPhone, iOS. You've got to get a certain, uh, the 30 pin plug, which I think is now long gone. Okay. Um, so on the Apple TV side of things, no, no support there for Ant Plus at the moment. Uh, Chatlow asks, uh, how have you guys found the battery life on the Phoenix 5 Plus, noticeably lower than the Phoenix 5, not using maps and music? Um, yeah, I've noticed maybe one less day. Uh, I, I could easily get uh, seven days uh, from last year's model, but um, yeah, maybe get one less day. And you know, my typical usage is about... I would say maybe an hour or two per day, you know, testing different activities and whatnot, um, sometimes with GPS, sometimes not. Um, and for me, uh, funny enough, I don't necessarily use maps nor music that often uh, on my device. So <clears throat> at the same time, yes, I have noticed that, but at the same time, it's still pretty darn good battery life overall. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions and we'll kind of wrap things up since we're passing through roughly 75 minutes here. Uh, so let's see. What else do we got? Some of the best, best running headphones, wireless headphones for the Garmin Phoenix. Um, kind of depends, I think, on what you sort of headphones you want. I use a pair of Skull Candy ones that go around the back, and I don't know the exact model. They're Skull Candies, wireless something or other, mm-hmm. um, which I know is a horrible description um, of what these headphones ask when you ask for a product recommendation. <laughs> but they're roughly fifty-five bucks if you find Skull Candy. They go around the back. I'll find them on Amazon in the meantime while ten while Des tells you his recommendations. Uh, so yeah, I have a lot of headphones myself. So. Um, Jaybirds tend to work pretty darn well for me. Um, you know, in terms of the connectivity issues, um, again, I think uh, you know having the Bluetooth um, uh, antenna basically on the same side as the same wrist that you're the same side that you were actually wearing your watch apparently can help. Funny enough, I didn't necessarily see a difference personally, but um, but yeah, for me, I'm kind of a Jaybird fan myself. So I've used X2s, X3s, the new Terras I've, I've used as well, and I haven't had any issues um, with any of them, you know, quite frankly. So yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. The ones I like are the Skull Candy Method Wireless, uh, 49 bucks on Amazon. Um, I will caution though that uh, I killed the pair that I own right now back in October. Um, so I haven't actually been able to use them since October. Uh, and I'm not really sure how I killed them. Uh, the rumor is apparently that you can kill them connecting to a Garmin Phoenix in some sort of way um, there's actually a whole like big long thread on the Garmin forums and whatnot about oh, this I don't think still um, so yeah it's, and a pe- few one. readers have mentioned this as well to me hmm. uh, either way mine are now dead um, so I've got to go buy or actually probably just got to call the support but I haven't had time to, to do that <laughs> um, so let's see a couple more questions here scrolling through uh, let's see best value triathlon watch 935 or 735 XT I think the 735 XTs, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, it may be getting a little bit long in the tooth at this point, but um, yeah, I mean, I think 735 is still a good value, yeah, yep. for what you're getting. Um, right alongside that value sort of question, uh, Velo Rider KM asks, uh, want the Apple Watch 4, but can't justify the cost. What is the best sub $300 smartwatch option for heart rate? Gosh, uh, I would say the Apple Watch Series 3. I would probably agree. I think uh, <laughs> the algorithm that they made to that over time makes it probably equal to, I would say, like a Garmin or a Polar or whatnot. I don't know. It's um, maybe also the Polar Vantage uh, M could sure. be an option mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the optical sensor there, as I say, on par uh, with what I've saw in the past. I haven't gone back and tested the Apple Watch Series 3 since last year, so I don't really know what algorithm improvements they made that may be backported from the Series 4 into the Series 3. So... All that kind of stuff is something to, to keep in mind. I would say the, the Vantage M could be worthwhile looking at. GPS accuracy-wise, I think both the Apple Watch and the Vantage M are probably in the same kind of like, meh, category. Sure, yeah, I agree. Cool. Uh, let's see, any, any last one you want to grab? That's about it. Headphones-wise, I'll throw in my two cents. The okay. Air- AirPods, just around the house. The AirPods are just really handy. Uh, I haven't run with them. They do seem to stick in my ears for the AirPods, so that's okay. Um, if we see the AirPods version 2... 
coming out this next year. that would be very interesting. I'll be I'll grab a pair of those. Don't worry. I'll mm-hmm. the sound quality of them and the convenience yeah. of them. Um, but for everything else, the um, Bose QC 35s. Mm. <laughs> yeah, probably they're... not good for indoor riding or any indoor sports because they're expensive and you don't want to sweat all over them but they for sound quality so yeah cool good deal um, now at the very beginning we mentioned the fact that this is very very last minute in terms of like setting us all up so last minute they didn't actually tell Des how to end this session yet um, so because <laughs> we did spend a few minutes on making this ending be smooth and not just like ending um, what's going to happen Des is you're going to click the one that says closer at the end there once we get to that point okay and then it just should something should happen either it will fail spectacularly or can we shut the lights off automatically again? That was awesome. That wait, was what, wait. What's our what's our uh, safe word? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stroop waffles. That's right. Yeah. Well, no, can we, we didn't bring them out. Oh, oh exactly. that was the whole point. <laughs> of we bought more. What a shame. You guys have to take them with you. Um, but first off, I want to first thank Des and Shane for coming over over the last uh, week. Uh, both of these fools made the mistake of flying halfway around the world, um, literally halfway around the world. Shane from Australia, Des from uh, the U.S. to help with the open house. They came for the open house. They got stuck helping. I mean, it was really crappy work. Uh, it was like cleaning toilets and trainers and dust off of trainers. It wasn't an idea. It wasn't like all fun and games. Uh, we probably only got to the fun part in the last couple of days of like putting up stuff and having stuff like that. So a huge thank you to both of them over the last uh, week. This has been an immense, immensely fun week for me. So no, I appreciate uh, your your generosity. Yeah, ah, for sure. No, it's been it's been a good time. And so uh, we will we'll do something again in the future. I think we'll, we'll figure something out. Do something like this, and maybe you guys will come in warmer weather, nicer weather. Oh yeah, it's a bit nasty here. Yeah, heading home <laughs> to thirty six degrees Celsius too. So I can't wait for that. Awesome. But, uh, and of course, thank you to everyone else for for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, Definitely appreciate it. And definitely subscribe to these two fools on YouTube and their their socials and all that jazz. Uh, the links are down in the description right there. So you can click right now. You can go and click subscribe to both of them. Uh, they both have awesome content coming out. Des has an Apple Watch Series 4 review. What, like next week? Come sure. Yeah. And I think Des has been working on something that you are not going to want to miss. Um, oh, yes. It's pretty darn fun. Yeah. This, I think it'll take the cake as the best...